on the 15th of September 2019, I released a video called 10 Things Wrong with Dragon Ball GT. This was my first foray into doing a proper YouTube video. I had no equipment then, I didn't have a green screen, I have a green wall in my bedroom. I didn't have a proper camera, I didn't have a proper mic or lighting. Now, near enough three years later and 100 episodes later, look how far I've become, look how far I've changed. So it's only fair that I do my favorite film of all time. Out of every video I've ever done, this one is going to hurt me the most. Part of me don't, uh, doesn't actually want to do this video. Anyway, I am Berryman and this is 10 Things Wrong With. Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan is a 1982 American science fiction action film directed by Nicholas Mayer. The film tells the story of an aging Admiral James T. Kirk who faces ghosts from his past from his love life to someone he abandoned on a planet 15 years ago who is out for revenge. And the cost of these ghosts returning will be great. When the film was released though, it got critical and amazing positive reactions. However, the film did get some negative reactions, focused in on its weak special effects and some of the acting. But those critics are wrong. But that doesn't mean there's nothing wrong with this film. So let us discuss 10 things wrong with Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan. Number 10. Promotions. For a ship that is predominantly naval based, even though Gene Roddenberry hated that, the amount of commanders that are on this ship is unbelievable. Lieutenant Uhura is now a commander. Commander Scott is still a commander. Ensign Chekhov is a commander and a first officer on another ship. And Lieutenant Sulu is now a commander. Now there was a deleted scene where Sulu was promoted to a captaincy, which I wish they put in because because they haven't, it means that when Chekhov joined the crew as an ensign, Sulu was a lieutenant, and now Chekhov has leapfrogged and becoming an executive officer on another ship. I'd be a bit hacked off. But yeah, why are there so many commanders on this ship? Number nine, missing planets. The mission of the USS Reliant is to go out and find a dead planet with no life. It's the complete opposite of what Star Trek was. But that was the mission of it. So, and to make it worse, they're going where everyone's gone before. They're not exploring anything new, they're just trying to find something dead. So they go to the City Alpha system and they go down to a planet that they thought was City Alpha 6. Did no one decide to scan the solar system to notice there was a missing planet? Because it turned out that City Alpha 6 exploded and they went down to City Alpha 5 which is why we got this film. Now, if anyone had done any sort of research before they did that, they would have known what would have happened and they would have stayed away clear, completely. People not doing their jobs is what caused this film to happen. Number eight, dating issue. In this film, Khan quite clearly says, 200 years ago, I was a prince with power and millions. Except that would have been the late 2000s, you would have been a prince. You were actually a prince in the late 1900s. You ousted in 1996, according to Space Seat. This film is set in the 2200s. It should have been 300 years ago. For somebody who is genetically intelligent superior, you're coming across as a bit of an idiot. And this isn't going to be the first time I question your intelligence. Number seven, pilot. Now, I'm not a military person, and this may be due to me not understanding, but like I said, I'm not a military person, but the pilot is the person piloting the ship, which in this case is Commander Sulu. So, when Spock turns around and says to Lieutenant Savick, Lieutenant, have you ever piloted a ship out of space dock? No, sir. Take her out. So she sits in the captain's chair. She's not piloting a ship out of space dock. She's giving an order for Sulu to pilot the ship out of space dock. Now, if, there, if I have got this wrong and the pilot is the captain, someone let me know. But as far as I was aware, in British military terms, the captain of the ship is called the commander of the ship. 
it's not the rank because captains can be commander of vessels, commanders can be commanders of vessels. Hell, some small ships actually have lieutenant commanders as commanders of vessels. They're not called pilots. The pilot is the person piloting the ship, I think. No, I'm definitely right on this one. Six, only ship in the quadrant. So when Captain Kirk speaks to Starfleet Command about his concerns, the Enterprise is dispatched to go and investigate because they are the only ship in the quadrant. They use that quite often. However, we already know that they're not because we've already seen the USS Reliance. So why didn't Starfleet try and contact the Reliance, give them new orders? And when that didn't work, they get back in touch with the Enterprise to say, well, the Reliant was supposed to be helping them out. We've lost contact. Because if they had done that, the first battle wouldn't have happened because they would have known there's something wrong with the Reliance and they would have been a bit more cautious. But because you said there's no one else available, Kirk being trusting of the rest of Starfleet doesn't question it. Although that does backfire on him as well. But why an intergalactic alliance called the Federation does not have any ships that are that close to home? doesn't make much sense. Number five, don't take me to sickbay. So during the first attack, Scotty's nephew, yes, he was Scotty's nephew, Preston, got fatally injured. So rather than waiting for medics to come, Scotty decides to take him. Does he take him to sickbay to try and save his life? No, he takes him to the bridge. Not being funny, you have to go past sickbay to get to the bridge. You killed your own nephew there, Scotty. But can someone explain to me what his mind was thinking? I mean, I know he was in grief. I know he wasn't thinking straight. But still, you went past Sick Bay to get to the bridge. And as a result, your nephew dies. If you took him to Sick Bay, McCoy might, saying might, might have been able to save him. Number four, loading torpedoes. So the Constitution class is actually classed as a heavy cruiser, which means it is battle ready. And it does have some impressive battlements, except it takes so frigging long to load a torpedo. Seriously, who designed that that you have to go along and take up the floor before you can load a torpedo? And not only that, once the floor's up, that torpedo moves so slowly. You're only going to be able to fire like, one torpedo every couple of minutes. No, you're going to need those torpedoes quick and fast. That is a very bad design flaw for what is my favourite ship in the whole of sci-fi. Number three, 2D thinking. So you know I said earlier that I am going to question Khan's superior genetic intelligence. This is it. Spock actually says that Khan is intelligent but not experienced and he is actually doing this in 2D thinking which is great because Khan is actually using Master and Commander as the basis of this fight which visually is absolutely amazing. It keeps us hooked. However, that's where the flaw is because you shouldn't think of this as two sea ships fighting. You should see this more as two submarines fighting where you would have the 3D effect in. Now, submarines aren't a recent thing. They've been around since the Second World War. And remember, Khan was actually at his height during the 90s, so way after the Second World War. So submarines were a thing. So why was Khan not thinking like that it's a bit confusing, and once again, Khan, I am questioning your genetic intelligence. Because it's not really that superior. Number two, funeral. So, after 100 episodes, you would think I wouldn't get that many technical issues. Yet, on the 100th episode, my camera decides to not work for this section. It's okay for the rest of the videos, just this one bit. Anyway, on with what I'm talking about. Now, in this film, there is a very heart-moving funeral for Spock. It's very well-deserved, and it really tugs at the heartstrings. Nothing wrong with the funeral whatsoever. However, what about everyone else who died? I mean, there was lots of people. Hell, you saw Preston, as we discussed. He died. Where's his funeral? Were their bodies left on the Genesis planet? There were so many deaths on that ship. 
what happened to all these funerals? Why didn't they have any? Or did their bodies get taken back home? And if that's the case, why didn't they take Spock's back home like he, they're supposed to? But I don't know, it was just unfair on everybody else who did not get a funeral. Number one, missing credit. So in this film, there's an actor called Judson Scott, who essentially plays Khan's number one. Possibly Khan's son, but predominantly his right-hand man. You know, the second in command. Quite a big role in quite a big action film. Yet, he goes uncredited. Completely. Now, the reason for this is Judson Scott did not want to be in the opening credits. And that's what he told his agent. However, Chinese whispers happened and <laughs> Judson Scott's agent told Paramount he didn't want to be in the credits. And as a result, he's not in the credits. Seriously, go and watch the end credits of uh, Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan. You will not see Judson Scott's name anywhere due to bad Chinese whispers. Which is a shame because he is not a m main character, but he is a major character in this film and does a lot of work in this film. And yet he accidentally got missed off. Final thoughts. So what do I think of this film? Well, this is my favorite ship of all time. I love this over and above. The TARDIS, I love this over and above. The TIE Fighters, any ship. In my opinion, this is just a work of beauty and I love this ship. I love this film. This film, I'm gonna put this down for a second because I don't want to break that. But this film, this film gave me my love of science fiction. This film gave me my love of film in general. This film gave me my love of my interest of behind the scenes workings of actually how a film is made. They have taken so many shortcuts in this film to try and get it the best film they can be and it paid off. A lot of the stuff was cheated. I mean, the uniforms that you see in this film, which are amazing, are actually the same uniforms from Star Trek The Motion Picture. They're just re-dyed and sort of recut a little bit. That's how much of a cheat they made on the, making this film. But what makes this film so good? Well, the story, it's engaging, it's heartwelling, and you don't actually have to watch the original series to understand because the exposition is done in such a way you understand it and it flows and works with the film. The special effects, whoever said the special effects were not very good needs shooting because these special effects are amazing. Yes, these are model shots. Yes, it was done in the 80s, but they hold up well today. You can go and re-watch it and think, wow, these special effects are amazing. Especially when you consider that the whole Genesis Planet sequence was the first major CGI scene ever seen in cinema and it still holds up today for something that was made in the 80s, early 80s to top it off. It was great. The score itself was amazing. The score works with the story. It keeps you emotionally invested. And every time I watch this film, I am hooked. I am hooked on everything. So much so, and I'm gonna be grim at this part, that whenever, hopefully not too soon, I pass away, I actually want that song played at my funeral. My children have been told that that's instructions because that's how much this film has actually meant to me. It was amazing and this is, in the whole entire Star Trek franchise, the best Trek ever. I have done a Star Trek worst to best list before and yes, this was at number one. I can't sing this praises enough. Now, I know I said last week that Star Wars was near enough a perfect film. This film is more nearer perfect than that. Yes, there are things wrong with it that I've gone through, but once again, I am being mega ultra nitpicky. So, I think this was obvious. This is going to give a 10 out of 10 berries. But that's my opinion. Granted, out of every film review I've done, I'm a little bit skew with. This was the hardest video I've had to do. <sighs> How have I done? What do you think? Let me know in the comments below. So let's go back to having some fun next week. Shall we do a Keanu Reeves sequel? Yeah, let's do a Keanu Reeves sequel. 
come back next week to find out which sequel I am on about. Till then, take care, bye bye.